James Doherty, welcome to our video series, Stories of Resilience. It's good to see you. Uh, um, you are the co-organiser of the forthcoming conference uh, in Glasgow on the 11th of June, which is now sold out, um, Aces to Assets. First of all, how did, how did it come about, the conference, so soon on the heels of the first conference, uh, Ace Away Nation, which was in September? The reason this became... Primarily, me and Kim's dream is because me and Kim have got lived experience and navigating what it's like to overcome adversity and the trials and tribulations of what it takes. And also, it was our dream to have a lived experience, grassroots-led conference. So it was our vision to put that at the forefront of the Ace, Ace Aware experience because it's not just about professionals, this is fundamentally driven by a grassroots movement and we're at the table. We're, you've included the excluded. I felt excluded all my life and here's the very people that I felt excluded by including me and saying, you know what, not only are you included, you can lead it. So in what way has has his, his work shaped your work then? In my own personal life, um, I had recovered from trauma and also recovered from addiction. But I didn't know my addiction was an attempt to self-medicate my trauma. And I wasn't happy about the current medical view about um, addiction being hereditary and it's passed in through the genes because I had kids. And I was like, what's the point in having kids if they end up with this awful gene that I might carry and that my kids might need to navigate uh, addiction the way I did and as anybody understands addiction it is an ugly hopeless world that people live in when they're experiencing addiction so I wasn't happy I thought it was I, I thought that um, view was limited so like James does I done a deep dive to discover more about it and when I discovered Gabor's work he, he answered lifelong questions he was basically saying it was more environmental it was more a developmental problem and that if we nurture our kids and bring them up in safe, emotionally connected, attuned, non-stressed, caregiving homes, then they're less likely, they're less likely to seek relief in substance. And it made sense because I hung about with people and some of them got addicted and some of them didn't. And through my own life experience and my observation of that, I was like, why is it some has got addicted and some has didn't? And he answered a lot of the questions for me. Not only did he answer it, he backed it up with the science, which was important as well. I'm reading reading his one of his books at the moment, and and it's a, it's an interesting because you realise sometimes as a layman how naive you can be when you think about the word addiction. Yeah. Because when you think about addiction, a lot of people will automatically think about substance abuse. Yes. However. There's much more to addiction than substance abuse. So it could be gambling, yeah. it could be sex, it could be modern technology, you know, yeah. mobile phones. Yeah. So it's much more than that. Is and is that is that part of the message of the conference as well, that it's not just about what we would ordinarily presume addiction is? Are we trying to broaden that 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 belief or or broaden that message about what addiction is? Absolutely. Because as soon as you mention addiction, people think drugs. And drug addicts are probably the modern day lepers, they're the most stigmatised cohort of people in our culture. I don't see anybody that's more stigmatised currently than people who are experiencing uh, the depravity and hopelessness of addiction. And Gabor basically covers the whole sp spectrum of addiction. He says addiction is um, short term gratification despite long term consequences. He says it more eloquent, eloquently than me. But it doesn't mention drugs. So that takes addiction into a whole different sphere. Because if you look at if you look at the most deprived wards in Glasgow, for example, that's where most of the bookies are. So why is it in the most deprived wards where the most poverty is, we put most of the bookies where people can gamble? And it only makes sense to me to know that where the highest levels of stress are is where people will be seeking relief for that stress. So what you see is higher levels of addiction, mental health. So it just so goes on. round and round and round. Absolutely. Um, 
we we spoke earlier this week and uh, we had a great conversation about policy and I, I, I we'll talk about Scotland and why Scotland in a moment but you said something to me that I think is worth sharing and it's about putting lived experience yeah lived experiences at the heart of what we're doing here around ACES in particular yeah. and about more people with lived experiences should be involved in the policy making absolutely did I did I get that right yeah and how should that how should that look well first of all the reason I said that is because fundamentally the ACE aware movement for me is fundamentally get relationships at the heart of it so it's about relational health or relational wealth because what causes people to experience most adversity is the poverty a relationship. It's who was missing when this stuff was happening. So it's not always about the stuff that was happening. It's about what was missing. And when you look at some of the policies, so it's like, for example, so if you grew up in an environment that's totally different for the environment that who's experiencing the, pov uh, the policy, then there is a disconnect between how the policy shaped. For example, I grew up in poverty and I grew up in an environment where there was community violence. So the ACES IQ even needs to be larger than just the 10. And we know that, we've always been aware of that. But it's created a fantastic conversation around about the trauma in our culture and that's why I was like, let's go. And we know it's limitations, but it means we can enlarge on it and get better outcomes to the people that are experiencing this adversity. So the question about policy is, I've got an internal frame of reference for how I've been brought up in the environment I've been brought up in, how I was educated, the relationships I was exposed to, what caused trauma, what it takes to recover from trauma, how I ended up in addiction, what it takes to recover from addiction, how I ended up in the justice system, what it takes to get away from the justice system how I experienced stigma trying to get an education, what it was like overcoming that stigma, what it's like trying to get a job when you've got some previous convictions and experiencing the stigma of that as well and what it takes to overcome it. That's a frame of reference that, I'm sorry, you can't teach it in a university, you can't teach it in a college and you can't teach it in a school. It's only a frame of reference you can come at the world with if you've lived through it. So the disconnect between some of the policy and how it's shaped is the people who have navigated that world are not at the table telling you that this part of the policy will best serve this person who might be experiencing the policy. So the understanding of the relationship needs to be more important than the policy or the strategy or the plan of action. Because if you don't understand that, then you're doing it to people rather than with them. And if you're doing something to me, and my will isn't involved in it, then it breeds conflict and it damages trust in relationship. And if you've experienced trauma or ad multiple adversity, then you don't always feel safe in relationship. So if the policy isn't safe or it isn't shaped in such a way that it, that it fosters relationship, then unwittingly it causes conflict. And to continue the debate, the Aces to Assets conference in June, is that is that one of the uh, one of the points that you that you want to personally and professionally make at the conference? Yeah. So the reason I came up with the hashtag is because so the the adverse childhood experience study can we can get stuck in this deficit lens at looking at these poor people of experience in this rather than seeing people's absolute potential. But in order to move to a solution, you need to be aware of what the problem is. So I think, and it's in the context that the, the study's in, it's proper because it tells you what the problem is, but it also tells you what the solution is. I'm more solution-focused than I'm more problem-focused, but I also know that if you try and apply a solution to a problem you don't understand, it will also breed conflict and you'll not get a healthy outcome for the individual. So the reason I came up with the assets but it's because don't look at me as a deficit, don't look at me as adversity, look at me as an absolute asset to any room I walk into. Because I define me and people who have experienced adversity, like I did, like the care system as well, don't look at me as if I'm going to be this kid that's destined for poor outcomes. 
Look at me as somebody who's got absolute potential, but because of the adversity I've faced in my life, I need a wee horn. I need a wee horn to get there. But I struggle to be in relationship with you because that's where I was hurt. So don't give up on me. And that's why I came up with the, the hashtag, which is as short as I could, to stop people viewing people like me who have experienced multiple adversity and trauma as, as, a, as a risk assessment. <laughs> rather than absolute potential. Hashtag Aces to Assets, which is the name of the conference. 2,000 people plus in the at the September conference, 1,800 plus at this conference coming up in June, and people will view this video, post that anyway. Yeah. What, why has Scotland taken this to its heart? And why does it, why is it, in your opinion, that Scotland seems to be leading this debate for the UK? I think um, my own personal view on it is, is we're always asking people to be more kind and more compassionate and I think um, our very nature is compassionate. We just need to look at the stuff that's in the road which is usually fear and judgement and stigma and all that other stuff. And I think the study has basically put a commonality to the, langu the com complex language of trauma because it is complex but it's it's speaking about it in layman's terms and it's became common enough for people to understand and it allows them to go ah I get it now and I, I don't think um, parents or systems or um, policies or strategies directly set out to re-traumatise people I don't think human beings are that cruel I think we want to do the right thing it's just unintended consequences because we don't understand the nature of the problem. For example, the justice system. So I speak about my... I'm really passionate about what's happening in the justice system and the care system and also education as well, and that's why there was a th the four themes. So health, justice, uh, care and education. Absolutely, mm -hmm. because I was in care and I don't think people go into work in care to unwittingly re-traumatise people. I don't think people work in the prison system or the justice system to unwittingly re-traumatise people or the education system or the healthcare system, but they absolutely do. But the good news about the A4 system is systems, systems are, when you understand this, then they can quickly do something about this. For example, the justice system is rife with addiction and mental health the Adverse Childhood Experience Studies telling us that the biggest predeterminating factor for ending up in addiction or with mental health issues is adverse childhood experiences. That's no me saying that, that's what the research is saying and a whole host of other trauma research. Um, it pains me when I look at the justice system, for example, drug addiction. So if you take one thing and it being drug addiction, You'll never punish addiction into a better way of being in the world. You'll never punish somebody clean because it's already a punishing enough experience. And if you understand trauma at the depth I do and you're trauma aware and ace aware, you will know that your best efforts to address the behaviour which addiction presents itself as is re-traumatising people. It's causing more pain which entrenches them in the addiction even further. So they need to seek more relief in the chemical that gives them a wee bit of peace in the world. So a judge, for example, sentences a, say a female shoplifter who's been shoplifting in the Glasgow City Centre to feed her drug addiction and she's been doing it for a long, long time. Where is it in the judge's mindset that he doesn't get to a place where he goes, sending this lassie to Cottonville time after time isn't working? Maybe she needs a care package in the community. Maybe we need to look at different sentences, sentencing options and alternatives to custody like maybe she needs to go to rehab and address her addiction and if she addresses that in there she might get down to the causes and conditions of what drove the addiction which is usually trauma and grief and loss and then she'll get a chance never to find herself back in the justice system. It's actually cheaper to send somebody to rehab than it is to keep them in prison. And, and are we getting there, do you think? Are we slowly getting there? Uh, it, you know, is, is that you work in justice? Uh, it, it is the justice um, area of what we're talking about. Uh, are they getting this at all? Is the penny dropping? 
they're getting it, but they're still the terror of error. So there's the, the whole debate round about uh, soft on justice and tough on justice. And if and it pains me because if you understand what it takes to overcome trauma or an addiction, for example, then putting somebody in Berlin is the easier, softer way. That's not the hard way. That's the easier, softer way. I'll tell you it's hard. Going into a rehab and having to look at your childhood trauma and having to work with a therapist or a team of people and work through addiction, the shame, the disgrace, the alienation, the social the, the social isolation that comes with it as well. That's, t that's tough. So the whole narrative around about soft and tough pains me because it's done fundamentally because it's about the terror of error and they need to look at what the fear is rather than look at the human cost. This is, this is people's lives. There's one last question. What does an ace away nation for Scotland look like for you, James? Um, <clears throat> an ace away Scotland for me, it looks basically like this. We recognise that we all belong to each other and that how I treat you is linked to how you might treat others and that every contact leaves a trace in regards to relationship and that if people who were writing policy were writing it for the perspective this policy might serve my sister, my brother and my son then it would be a different world, I believe if we fully, fully recognised that we all belong to each other because right now I, don't think, I think we don't recognise that but we're getting there what a great way to, to end the interview and a great way to um, end this particular series of stories of resilience. James, best of luck with the conference. Sold out. Um, I'm really looking forward to what you and Kim have got to say on the day as well as Gabor and Darren and, and everybody else. But in the meantime, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Gary.